now the word of the Lord as it is written in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as if of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as a sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. And further from the work, Conjugal Love, a portion of number 444. It relates a part of a conversation held in the spiritual world between Swedenborg and two angels who had died as infants in this world. And the subject is the origin of evil. Man was created so that all he wills, thinks, and does appears to him just as if in himself and thus of himself. Without this appearance, man would not be man, for he could not receive, retain, and as it were appropriate to himself anything of good and truth or of love and wisdom. Therefore it follows that without this, as it were living appearance, man would have no conjunction with God, and therefore no eternal life. 
But if from this appearance he induces on himself the belief that he does will, think, and therefore do good of himself and not from the Lord, although it is to all appearance as if of himself, then he turns good into evil within him and thus makes in himself the origin of evil. This was the sin of Adam. But I will open this subject somewhat more clearly. The Lord looks at everyone in the frontal part of his head, and this look passes through into the back part of his head. Beneath the frontal part is the cerebrum, and beneath the back part is the cerebellum. The latter is dedicated to love and its goods, and the former to wisdom and its truths. He, therefore, who looks with the face to the Lord, receives wisdom from him, and through wisdom, love. But he who looks backward from the Lord receives love and not wisdom. And love without wisdom is love from man and not from the Lord. And this love, because it conjoins itself with falsities, does not acknowledge God but itself as a God. And this it tacitly confirms by the faculty of understanding and of becoming wise as if of himself, which is implanted in man from creation. This love, therefore, is the origin of evil. That this is, show, that this is so can be shown to the eye. I will call to myself some evil spirit who turns himself away from God and speak to him from behind or into the back part of his head, and you will see the things said will be turned into their opposites. And I call such a one. He presented himself, and I spoke to him from behind, saying, Do you know anything about hell, about damnation, and about the torment there? And presently, when he had turned toward me, I asked, What did you hear? He answered, I heard this. Do you know anything about heaven, about salvation, and about the happiness there? And afterwards, when these words were spoken to him, Behind his back he said that he had heard the former. Then it was said to him from behind his back, Do you know that they who are in hell are insane from falsities? And being asked by me concerning this, what he had heard, he said, I heard, Do you know that they who are in heaven are wise from truths? And when these words were spoken behind his back, he said that he had heard, Do you know that they who are in hell are insane from falsities? and so on, from which it is manifest that when the mind turns itself away from the Lord, it turns to itself and then perceives opposites. This is the reason why in the spiritual world, as you know, no one may stand behind another and speak to him. For thus a love is inspired into him, which is his own intelligence, and which his own intelligence favors and obeys on account of its delight. But which, because it is from man and not from God, is a love of evil or a love of falsity. Here end our lessons. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one God of heaven and earth. Amen. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches in Asia. And I turn to see the voice that spake with me. Our sermon this morning is entitled, Turning to the Lord. The text is from the opening chapter of the book of Revelation. And I turn to see the voice that spake with me. One of the many wonderful things about the word is that every single thing about it is holy. Every word, every phrase, every nuance contains within it infinite levels of meaning. Every noun, every verb, every adjective, however casually stated it may appear to be, contains within it truths sufficient for an endless number of sermons if we but knew the hidden meanings within the letter. Today we are focusing on the Apostle John's turning when he heard the Lord's voice from behind him, 
so that we may see the significance of this turning in both our lives and the life of the church. John, the most beloved of the Lord's apostles, the one who had lain on his breast at the Last Supper, tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day when he heard behind him a great voice as if of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. That John first heard these words of the Lord uttered from behind him is, of course, of great significance. John represents those who from love hear and obey the Lord. And the voice from behind him signifies the manner in which the Lord appears to us before we fully turn to him and acknowledge him as he is in his glorified divine human. John had followed the Lord throughout the three final years of his earthly life. He had stood at the foot of the cross. He had seen the empty tomb. He had seen the risen Lord before his ascension into the heavens. And all of this was, as it were, a preparation for this moment in John's life, the occasion on which his spiritual state would further turn to the Lord so as to see him as he is in his fully glorified divine human, and not merely as just the resurrected spirit of the man Jesus. Mary Magdalene had also had to make such a turning when she stood weeping that first Easter morning before the empty sepulcher. Twice we are told that Mary turned on this occasion. After talking to the angels, it is said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed the Lord to be just another man, a gardener perhaps. And she asked the Lord, not knowing that it was he, where she could find the body of Jesus. And then the Lord said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Because both John and Mary Magdalene accompanied Jesus of Nazareth during much of his earthly ministry, there's a tendency to assume that this close relationship must have given them a truer sight of his divine human than that of those who had not known the Lord so intimately. But such natural proximity does not impart true spiritual sight, as signified by the turning that each needed to make before a genuine vision of the Lord could be had. It is well known that familiarity is not the sole ingredient of faith. For the Lord said that a prophet is not without honor save in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. It is this same kind of familiarity that those raised in the church must often overcome before historical faith becomes alive for them and lives in their heart. Most who are born within the universal Christian church have within them from childhood a mental picture of the Lord similar to that of the Apostle John and Mary Magdalene before they turned themselves to him. But these childhood ideas concerning the Lord are incomplete and they cannot endure for long for they're bound up with our natural ideas and our proprial loves and as such they are finite and they are clouded by falsities. Therefore there comes a time when these immature concepts must give way to a new side of the Lord that is appropriate to our adult states, a sight that will enhance or destroy our former ideas, depending on which way we turn. In every life, there comes a time in which a pivotal point is reached, and the occasion comes and goes 
as a thief in the night. Our spiritual freedom demands that it be so, for love, not fear, must make the choice. At this moment, the forces of good and evil within us come into a state of spiritual equilibrium, and we stand as a motionless weather vane on a windless day. This is the moment of decision for which our entire lives have been but a prelude and a preparation therefore. It is the moment in which the ruling love will be confirmed, either by turning our faces to the Lord in the kingdom of heaven or to self in the kingdom of the world. All of our past lives have been but a preparation for this time when we stand free to make the only choice that we will ever make entirely on our own, that is, whether to turn to the Lord or to self. The time of turning comes at no ordained age in the life of man, for much depends upon our heredity and our environment. All that can be said for certain is that for adults, such a turning is always made before death. The consequences involved in our turning are always hidden from us at the moment of decision. The external circumstances may seem quite insignificant in comparison with life's other events. It is only in retrospect that a spiritual turning in our lives can be seen, and then only by those who have turned to the Lord. To say that we turn to or away from the Lord is not merely a figurative way of speaking, for there is an actual turning of our spiritual interiors. This can be seen in the spiritual world where we read that all of the angels of heaven turn their foreheads to the Lord as a son, and all of the spirits of hell turn the back of the head to him. And the spirits from hell receive influx into the affection of their will, which in themselves are lusts, and make their understanding favor them. But the angels receive influx into the affection of their understanding, and they make their will favor them. Hence, these are in wisdom, but the others in insanity. For the human understanding resides in the cerebrum, which is in the forehead, and the will in the cerebellum, which is in the back of the head. From influx number 13. Turning to the Lord is among the first of many spiritual decision points in our lives, and its importance can scarcely be emphasized enough. However, its occasion does not signal the completion of the Lord's work of salvation, but only its beginning. For it is in the performance of spiritual uses that all spiritual good from us must finally terminate. It is for this reason that there is another similarity beyond the spiritual turning in the stories concerning Mary Magdalene at the tomb and John on the Lord's day. Both in conjunction with their turning received instructions from the Lord. Mary was told to go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. John also was instructed by the Lord, for he was told to write the things which he saw in a book and to make it known. The new sight they were about to receive from the Lord could only be given if they were willing not only to receive it in their hearts, but also to make it known to others. For the Apostle John, this was one of four occasions on which he was instructed to make the truths of the word known to others. John had first been sent as one of the twelve during the Lord's earthly ministry to preach the kingdom of heaven to the remnant of Israel. After the resurrection, he was among the eleven, the eleven disciples, whom the risen Lord told to go and preach the good news to the Gentiles. Seventeen centuries later, John was again sent, along with the other apostles, to preach the gospel 
in the spiritual world. But on this third of those four occasions, John stood alone in the spiritual world as he was told to make this revelation known to the Christian world represented by the seven churches in Asia. As was stated earlier, the Word of God is so infinitely rich in truths that endless sermons could be preached on each of its words or its phrases. For example, John's representation is so filled with meanings that we can only hope to understand a relative few of them during our life in this world. For the remainder of our sermon this morning, let us look at this apostle's signification as it applies to the life and the times of the church. John, in one sense, represents the Lord's new church, which is the New Jerusalem. This church was founded as were the former churches among a remnant of the earlier church, that is, among a group of Christians who remained in the good of love to the Lord. Although this remnant was in the good of love to the Lord, it nevertheless, as to its understanding of the word, was shaded by the falsities of doctrine that had been invented and accepted as dogma over the centuries. In order that this veil of falsity and ignorance might be lifted, the Lord provided for a new revelation of divine truth in the heavenly doctrines of the New Jerusalem. It was the voice of the Lord in the theological writings of Emanuel Swedenborg that the first new churchmen heard as if from behind them, as did John on that Lord's day. The voice of the Lord in the heavenly doctrines was first heard over 200 years ago when the Arcana Celestia was published in England. From a few early receivers, a tiny remnant soon was gathered whose numbers slowly but steadily began to grow. Many of these early new churchmen clearly discerned that it was the Lord's voice which spoke to them in the writings. But as a church, they had not made that spiritual turning which must take place before a new sight of his divine human can be given. For a time there followed a period of indecision as to whether this new sight of the Lord could grow and develop within the former church or if a separation would be required. Some turned back as did Mary Magdalene the first time, and could not recognize the true nature of this new revelation, which was so unlike the scriptures. Others, however, turned themselves, as did Mary the second time, when the Lord spoke her name, and they clearly saw the divine nature of the Lord's new word. When the infant new church turned to the Lord, acknowledging the divine nature of the heavenly doctrines. It stood spiritually where John had stood after he turned to see the voice that spake with him from behind. And as John had seen new things, so too the church began to see new and wonderful things with a rational clarity never thought possible. Before the spiritual eyes of these early receivers, there unfolded a new and more complete sight of the Lord than even that beheld by John. For the word once lost had been found, and the hidden meanings of its literal sense were revealed. Now, while all marveled at these new sights of truth in the heavenly doctrines, there were some who did not recognize a need for anything further. They failed to heed the Lord's words to John, What thou seest, write in a book. Years, even decades, of writing lay ahead, during which the doctrines of the church needed to be gathered and formulated from the writings before there could be a general acceptance of these divine teachings. Today, the church stands ready 
with a treasury full of doctrinal insights developed and organized over the past century by a number of dedicated theologians who have faithfully recorded what they have seen in their studies of the writings. To say, however, that the church stands ready implies that it clearly foresees its next divinely appointed task, a task which is signified in the Lord's words to John, send it unto the seven churches, meaning to the Christian world. Do we as a church clearly see the need to complete that task which the Lord has given us to do? Or will we stop now that we have written what has been seen in a book, as others in the past have stopped after only turning and seeing? The Lord has called his church to fulfill his divine commission to make the truths of his word known to the world. Twice in the Gospels we are instructed to spread his word. Again, as we have seen today in the book of Revelation, he commanded his word to be sent to all. And finally, on the 19th of June in 1770, the Lord again gave us an example of the need to spread the threefold word. Clearly, the Lord has spoken, but will the church heed his call? If we are, as most believe, an organization which helps to serve the external needs of a church specific, then it seems likely that the Lord will lead us to complete the tasks that he has given us to do. This leading, of course, will be done in freedom, but it will be done either from within or from without. From within, the Lord has already beckoned to us in his word. If we respond to this spiritual call from within and are faithful servants in the growth of his church, then there will be no need for us to be led from without. Should we fail, however, to heed his urgings from within, then we will be led by the necessities of the world from without, much as the children of Israel were led from without to do the Lord's bidding. But let us not this morning look back on examples of the Lord's leading from without, but let us look upward and forward toward the sun of the spiritual world. Let us turn our faces to the east and resolve to do his bidding. As a church, we have heard the Lord's voice from behind. We have turned to his new word and beheld the wonders of his second coming. We have fulfilled his divine command to write. Let us now move forward and complete the task for which we have been prepared, that is the bringing of the Lord's new word to all mankind. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Thank you for listening. To learn more, visit newchurch.org. And to connect with other people, visit us at groups.newchurch.org.